Going back a little bit to uh, Casablanca, fair or unfairly, that's that's the legacy uh, of your dad. And in reading and studying the film and how it was made, reading your father's memoir, this was not a movie that he wanted to make because he looked at it, and and this is another reason it explodes the myth of that they made Casablanca and they didn't know how it was going to end. Well. They, they might not have known what the, the dialogue was and all of that, but it was obvious that, you know, uh, Ilsa was going to go off with Victor. Yeah. It was just how they were going to get there, but he figured he wasn't going to get the girl, and then Hal Wallace basically bought his contract, gave him billing, and, and then he said, well, I'll do it. How did your father feel about the whole legacy of Casablanca following him, where in, in his last years, you know, that was what that and, and um, lighting those two cigarettes and now Voyager, people seem to remember that. And there's so much more to his career and his life than those two things. Sure. Did that bother him at all? For the people making Casablanca, it was just a job. Yeah. I mean, they were showing up, saying their lines, arguing, yeah. fighting, doing whatever they do on the set. And it was really no big deal. It right. was just a movie. Right. And job uh, work. a job, a, yeah, a, a work. He, and he literally, literally mm -hmm. walked off the set of Now Voyager and across the street into the other sound stage and started working on Casablanca. I mean, it was like right yeah. there, one right directly after the other. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I, there are conversations uh, that I know of that that you know were discussed at, at later times mm -hmm. that. Um, it, Lou thought it would be good for him to do it because it put him in the company of Bogey. It was going to be an, an A film, but even that doesn't mean it's it's not you know like we have Star Wars now or or whatever the newest. It was not thing. a franchise. It was not a franchise. <laughs> it was not a franchise, but it was also not, they didn't know what the audience was going to do with Bogey playing that kind of a character where he was more romantic, less gangster, whatever have you, and and. Um, they knew they had something because they had Bergman, and she was definitely, yes. definitely on the rise. So, um, for him, when he first got the original, the, the first script that, mm -hmm. that they had, um, which was actually a, a script, script that had a beginning and an end, and uh, he just went, you know, this is I can't play this. This is there are two reasons. One, there's no dialogue in the in the original uh, mm -hmm. play. Um, you hear about Victor Laszlo, you don't see Victor Laszlo that right. much. So you had to pump that part up to, to get my father even to start to pay attention to the whole thing. And then the other thing, and the thing that I think really bothered him the most, for lack of a better word, or what he fought for, was he had now achieved the status where his name and the name of the leading lady was above the title of the film. He exactly. achieved it in Joan of Paris, he achieved it in certainly now Voyager. And he felt they were going to put his name down with Sidney Greenstreet and, and Claude Rains and so on and so forth. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but once you have gone above the title, if you go below the title, you're dead meat, dude. You're not, you're not climbing the ladder back up again. It just doesn't happen. Then, maybe probably not even now anymore either. So he fought pretty hard uh, with Lou, and then Lou in turn fought for him to make sure that his name was above the title. Right. So, with and yes, and with Berman and Bogart. Right. So, all the original posters, all the original cards, all the original lobby cards, et cetera, they have that. Mm -hmm. After the 19, gosh, I don't know, 70s, and certainly after the 91 mm -hmm. release, uh, his name is below the title because that original contract had expired. <laughs> yeah, that's showbiz. Yeah. You know. <laughs> And it always, it's interesting to me when they talk about it being such a great romance. I don't see it, I mean, yeah, okay, great, it's a romance. But for me, it's really the story of integrity and, exactly. and doing the right thing. Yeah. They all did the right thing. Mm -hmm. And I think that's part of why that film survives as a classic. Mm -hmm. And because every, everything in there, there is something for everybody to relate to. If it's a lost love, if it's if it's trying to get away from something that is absolutely impossible to live with, if it's what, whatever it is in your life, you can connect with it. That film is about human emotions and integrity and doing the, the right, right thing. thing. Yeah, and it endures. It does, and that's why. Day. 
Exactly. It's, it's not about, you know, action and gunfights and car chases. It's mm -hmm. about human beings talking to each other about their innermost feelings and their innermost concerns and how are we going to make it through this day. Okay. Your dad, you couldn't describe him as anyone that went Hollywood, but he did have some friends and particularly, he got close to Betty Davis. Oh, yeah. Could you tell us a little bit about the friendship between your dad and Betty Davis? Sure. Of course, you were friends with Betty Davis. In fact, you were in a movie with Betty Davis. <laughs> Dead <laughs> Rancor. What were they doing here? Yeah, I don't know. Did you know what you Tell us about Betty. Tell us about Betty. Uh, Betty was absolutely sensational. Mm -hmm. uh, if she was your friend, she was your best friend. She was just an amazing human being. Totally committed and passionate about life and her work. And one of the reasons why they got along so well, and I think the original reason they got along so well, was because they were both consummate professionals. When you were working, work came first. You knew your lines, you knew your partner's lines, you knew why you were saying what you were saying, you hit your mark, you, you found interesting ways of interacting with each other, and that's really where it started. And my father, you know, how do I put this politely? He had a taste for very strong women. My mother, mm -hmm. uh, Betty, Ida Lupino, who was also a good friend, mm -hmm. Hedy Lamar, who was mad as a hatter and a genius. <laughs> um, but they are very strong personality. Oh, and Kate Hepburn, let me not leave her out. But the, these, these are very strong personalities. And he, he enjoyed that. He enjoyed the, the challenge and the sparring and the sense of humor and the intellect and so on and so forth. So Betty had all of those things. She was the queen of all of those things. Right. And my biggest memories with her as in from childhood is or are that we never celebrated Thanksgiving. My parents being Austrian, it wasn't in their, you know, DNA at all. Right. And my father No they, pilgrims oh, in they, Austria. Yeah. <laughs> Not I mean the concept of a turkey in our house, I can't even he would never <laughs> I, and he was a foodie. Yeah, your, your father had some very specific <laughs> ideas yeah. about food. Yes, yeah, and turkey well. was not on yeah. the menu yeah. ever, <laughs> ever. So Thanksgiving, when Betty was on the West Coast, was always at Betty's. And when we arrived, and I remember that from when I was quite young, uh, she would come to the door and the scotch and the cigarette in one hand and the other <laughs> arm loose so that she could grab you. And of course, she was like, you know, five. Four, and my father was over 6'3", and so it was kind of an interesting collision. But, and then my mother, and then, you know, whatever. And, and then she would say, yes, 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 you know, children go to the swimming pool, and grown-ups go to the bar, and I'm going back to the kitchen and supervising, and blah, 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 and I've been in the kitchen all day working and cleaning and cooking, and yeah, right, yeah, of course. But actually, she was a very good cook, so I shouldn't, mm -hmm. I shouldn't go again. But she was always, it was like in jeans and a chambray shirt and a do-rag around her head. I mean, it was, she portrayed the role of that person who was in the kitchen, you know. And just to make sure that we keep the theme of Hollywood alive, the caterer who did do the cooking, her name was Helen Hayes. <laughs> really. She came to work for us, too. She was fabulous. <laughs> great cook, great cook. But Betty, Betty was a friend like, like a friend, you know. What is a friend? It's the person you call and you say, oh my God, my children are going through chaos. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was, they, they, were, they were tight. And I shouldn't say just Betty and my father. It was Betty, my mother, and my father. All, mm -hmm. all the three of them together. And sometimes my parents would team up against her. Sometimes it was my mother and Betty teaming up against him. <laughs> you know, yeah, and lots of cigarette smoke. Oh, God. There were days I didn't want to walk into the living room when the three of them were in there. So. <laughs> no. Oh, your mom and dad did smoke. They, they did smoke. Yeah. They didn't Everybody smoke like did. he smoked in, in this. No, 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 no. That's, He was rivaling Robert Mitchum out of the past. Oh, oh, cigarettes and a 90-minute movie or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> 